Hello, Andy Booth. Welcome. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be there. Yeah. <laughs> so, Andy, you're an Australian. We can see your hat. That makes a yes. thing about Australia. Uh, but you have been living in France since the last 20 years. You are yes. a professional horseback rider and teacher. And you have initiated the horsemanship approach, but also the horseman's science program. Yes. And you have accompanied the most renowned horses and riders across the globe. Well, before we dive into the topic of resilience, would you tell us a little bit more about your work? Yes. Um, well, thank you very much for having me. I, um, I started out on, on, on a farm in Australia, so it was about you know, 3,000 hectares. And I guess the horse was like a, a work tool. It's something that we use to work with the cattle. And the horseman was something that I think a lot of us young rural Australians, we aspired to be. When I grow up, I want to be a horseman. And, uh, and that's never really left me. I've probably never really grown up either. <laughs> but, but I've always wanted to become a horseman. And I guess the great thing about that is that it's a, it's a kind of a, it's a voyage that, that, that has no finish. You never really get to where you're trying to get to. I was lucky. I, I won a, an, a, an award from, from the Commonwealth, from the Queen of England, to, to study horsemanship and to try and find a more ethical way of, of teaching and training horses. Some of the breaking in, as we used to call it, it's not a very nice term, I know, but some of the way we used to handle horses, even you know, not so far back in the 80s, we were still breaking in horses, trying to break their spirit so that we could get along with them. And of course, the more that we've advanced with science and the more that these good horsemen are, are showing their, their stuff, the more we know now that we can actually train horses in an ethical way. It doesn't have to be violent. It doesn't have to be dangerous. And I guess one of the interests from the Queen, who has, has always been very passionate about horses, was that if a young Australian goes to America, learns these techniques and can bring them back to Australia, then that would be a good thing for that horse culture. And, and I did that and then I, could, I moved to Europe because I could see a real, really good equitation over here, but maybe I need to become more of a horseman, not just a great rider, not just a good pilot, but, but a horseman. And I suppose being a horseman and explaining that using scientific terms, not, not, not relying on anthropomorphism, because I think that's something that we do a lot in the horse industry is that we try and make the horse seem like it's a human and that's not really fair on the horse. So, so these are all things that interest me and I guess uh, I've been passionate about it. I've always wanted to do something I was passionate about. I've tried different jobs when I was younger and nothing seemed to work. And, mm -hmm. and, and as I'd say to anyone, if you, if, whatever you're going to do with your life, do something you're passionate about because uh, it's just too short to waste it doing something you hate. <laughs> Thank you, Andy, for sharing. And we can hear the passion in your voice. I also like very much um, how you put ethics uh, at the center of what you do and how you approach the relationship between horses and, and humans. So when we talk about resilience and we had a brief conversation together to, to share what we do at the Resilience Institute, but how does that resonate for you? How does the concept of resilience resonate for you in your environment? I think I, I, I would imagine in whatever people do, whatever, you know, might be, whatever job or whatever profession people might choose, there would be ups and downs. And there is, of course, in this business as well. I've, I've, I've had horses getting ready for enormous demonstrations, world equestrian games, and the horse has been lame, had, a, had, a, had an injury a few weeks before the demonstration. And I've had to change the horse and change the whole thing. So deceptions are going to happen. And I don't think anyone, uh, you'd be dreaming if you were, especially in the horse industry, probably, <laughs> you'd be dreaming if you were thinking that deceptions aren't going to happen. And we're working with live animals, big athletes. Deceptions happen, accidents happen, things go wrong. Uh, look, I've got a calendar full of clinics and COVID's happened and my calendar's just not working out. And I think the thing that I keep coming back to is, is reminding myself why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm. And probably the, the, the biggest thing, if I think in terms of resilience, is to, and I think it was Simon Sinek or someone uh, who, who wrote that book, The Power of Why, 
And to me, that's a really powerful question to always come back to that and say, okay, why do I do what I do? Mm. Uh, and, and make sure you're doing what you do for the right reasons. I, I mean, you know, sometimes I, I run a lot of clinics one after the other and I know I'm doing it to make a living. But as soon as I start getting motivated by making money out of it, uh, it just loses the passion. So I've just got to remember, okay, why do I do what I do? I'm passionate about horses. I love horse training. I want people to be safe. I want horses to keep out of trouble. Uh, and as soon as I remember why I do what I do, then that way I can get out of the bed in the morning with a spring in my step. Mm. But if I lose the focus of why I do what I do, and if that passion goes away, then, you know, I think for anyone, resilience becomes a hard thing. But if I need to get up and keep going and keep driving and, and keep pushing, uh, you know, I just give myself a little chat on why I do what I do. And, mm. and I find that I find that spring in my step. And I, again, Thank you. Yes, indeed. Passion, but also purpose uh, is so important for resilience. So when you remind yourself about why you do what you do, it gives you that inner strength to face the most uh, challenging times. Well, Absolutely. I think there's three things in that. Yeah, there's the passion. Yeah. I think you need that. The purpose, um, and, you know, as we say in French, the pourquoi, the why, um, the, pa the passion, the purpose and the principles and, and, and sticking with your principles. And if I can have passion and purpose and principles in what I do, then I can just keep on keeping on. And principles, um, do you mean values? Is that what you refer to when you say principles? I, I guess, especially when we're working with animals, you know, we can make things happen. We can force things to happen. We can, we can be pretty hard on them. And, uh, and you could probably win competitions by, by getting away from ethics, but you've got to stick with your values. You've got to stick with your principles and say, okay, I'm not willing to go to this. I'm not willing to hurt the horse. I'm not willing to scare the horse. I'm not willing. You've got to have, you've got to have principles in this game. And, and if you don't, uh, I think, you know, for anyone, it, it's got to get difficult to sleep with yourself. Uh, and, and, you know, the most important, I, I guess, is when you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror, you've got to be, you've got to be able to put up with him. You're going to put up with everyone else as well. <laughs> but the first person you've got to be able to put up with is the guy in the mirror. And, uh, And that's where, you know, sticking with your principles is really important. You can look at that fella in the mirror and say, yeah, you're all right. You're doing all right. And in, in this work you do with, uh, with horses, um, I was fascinated to learn that um, horses do not have a prefrontal cortex. You told me that. The prefrontal cortex, I didn't know that. The prefrontal cortex is the most evolved part of the human, human brain. This is what we use a lot ourselves when working during the day. This is where we make decisions. This is where we uh, assess different options. So that's not happening for horses. So how do you manage that? Um, how do you motivate horses, considering that they're not able to actually understand this cognitive dimension that is totally part of who we are uh, ourselves as human beings? Sure. And in some ways, you know, it might even make it easier. Uh, you know, I think if a horse had reasoning abilities and analytical abilities, was able to analyze the situation, probably he wouldn't let us get on their back. I mean, 600 kilos of horse, if he could say, look, you know, I'm 600 kilos, I've got amazing force, I can, I can kick with, you know, uh, my kicking pressure is twice my body weight. So, you know, you, you just wouldn't be able to get on them. So I guess we're lucky uh, in some ways that they can't think, reason, analyze like we can. And I, it makes it a, a big advantage because you, finally we're just, we, we know that they can't lie. They can't, they don't even have moral values. And I guess that's a, a big thing that humans need to understand when they're working with horses is that they, they don't know right from wrong and good from bad. So the horse can't really be wrong. And apart, once we've got that worked out and we know that they can only be innocent because they wouldn't know how to be wrong, they can be very badly educated. That's for sure but they're not doing it to be wrong. And some people say, oh, the horse is disrespectful, but you know, they don't even know that notion. They, they're just well-trained or badly trained. And I think sometimes when people say the horse is disrespectful, they're, they're blaming the horse for the problems. Whereas what they should be saying is the horse is poorly educated and that's my fault. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're working with something that can't actually be wrong, it really helps because you say, okay, well, he can't be wrong. So what can I do to try and help the horse through this? And we know that we're just conditioning responses that they, that they learn through association, not through reasoning abilities. And, and as, as soon as we and using motivation, and I suppose we'll talk about that in a moment, but understanding what motivates the horse and saying, okay, how can I teach you to move away from the pressure of a halter that I put on your head? Or how can I teach you 
um, the responses for what we call AIDS in equitation. How can I teach you this means go forward, this means stop, and this means turn? And all these things, if we're conditioning those responses with precision, and we've got a lot of empathy for that animal, we're not blaming the animal and we're not getting stuck in, in anthropomorphism, because I think the human can be very anthropomorphic, he can be very anthropocentric, he thinks that he's the center of the whole, you know, how in the world will the world get along without us? <laughs> very well, indeed, probably. So I think, I think we've got a few little problems there. And the horse brings us back to earth and the horse is, um, mm. you know, he can't be wrong. He's always innocent and we need to be able to help. And I guess developing empathy and understanding how to motivate the animal is really important. How can I cause my idea to become my horse's idea? I think that's something that I'd probably say only every day when I'm teaching is how can you cause your idea to become the horse's idea? How can you organize the situation not make the horse do it because you can't, you're too little, the horse is too powerful, you'll get in a fight, you won't win. Even if you win, you'll lose. So how can I cause my idea to become my horse's idea? Really interesting, Andy, because um, of course, I'm looking at the parallel between what you do and leadership. And, and of course, we recognize that we are leading men and women and not horses, but there are probably Absolutely. interesting insights. Um, and I like the idea about being fully accountable and responsible as a leader, uh, instead of pointing to the others what they have not done, what they should have done differently, just wondering, how can I respond to this differently? How can I empower the person? How can I put myself in that person's shoes? So this is really empathy. And how can I create an environment that will favor or optimize the chances that my team members will adopt the behaviors that we believe um, will be the most constructive for the whole team? So would you confirm that the environment is extremely important in your experience, the environment that you are creating uh, in the relationship influences a lot the um, ultimate behaviors of the, of the horses? Absolutely. And I guess you know, as I was listening to what you were saying there, I was thinking there's two things. One, you know, don't blame the horse. Uh, he wouldn't know how to be wrong anyway. And the other thing is don't take things personally. They don't, they, being in the absence of this prefrontal cortex they, they don't know right from wrong and good from bad but they don't have bad intentions now i'm not saying that every horse is easy to work with you, you you get into difficulties but the horse can't be doing it to be wrong or against you it's not personal and i guess when you're working with horses and you're always saying to yourself okay it's not personal how can i help if you could adopt that into every human situation you'd probably get through a lot of situations with a lot less conflict don't take things personally and I think when working with a horse, you have to adopt that because otherwise it's just too hard on you. If you're taking everything that goes wrong personally with the horse, you'd be pretty worn out by the end of the day. So don't think, take things personally. It's not personal. You need to help the horse. You don't need to blame him. You don't need to criticize him. You don't need to get in a fight. You need to help him through it. And, uh, and I think, you know, I've met a lot of really good horsemen and most good horsemen are good men. So, or women, of course. Uh, when I use the word horseman, I'm talking about man in the human sure. sense. <laughs> Uh, so don't think, take things personally and understand also the, the importance of the environment because the horse is a prey animal. So that means, you know, they're very aware of their environment and their preservation is, is of the ultimate importance to them. If you're spending, you know, the last million years getting hunted and you're a prey animal, your brain works pretty differently. So anything that could be uncomfortable or dangerous, they're very, very aware of it. And it's getting the horse more concentrated, it's kind of like keeping them a little bit busy so that they're really concentrated on you and not concentrated on the, on the, out, on the other outside things and developing a confidence where the horse says, okay, I'm okay with you. I don't need to worry about that plastic bag. I don't need to worry about that pigeon. I don't need to worry about that dog. I don't need to worry about that. And once we go out in public, you know, I don't need to worry about that great big uh, digital screen. I don't need to worry about all those people clapping. And really having the horse concentrated on the human and, and that there's a real relationship of confidence that develops. There's, there's connection and confidence. There's two things that we really need. Super interesting. It, of course, makes me think about uh, the concept of psychological safety that sure. we know is so important in a team uh, because it is what helps a team to go through difficult situations when they feel secure in a, in a team. So as you mentioned, connection, relationships, um, trust is absolutely critical to face challenges and to make sure that in your case, uh, the horses do not feel too fearful and traumatized by the various challenges that may, uh, that may happen. 
sure. Well, and without talking about the ethics of it, you know, just 600 kilograms of scared animal is very, very dangerous. So, uh, so we, we, we need that not only so that they feel better, but also that, that, so that we can be safe. Uh, and if the animal is concentrated on, on his human um, and, and confident in that environment, confident with the person, then of course that makes us a lot safer. Very good, absolutely. Maybe one last question for you, Andy. Um, we can clearly hear that you're totally passionate about your work and also extremely knowledgeable. What has your work taught you about human nature in general? What would you say about that? I'd say, like, I, I mean, I've mentioned quite a few, um, quite a few of the, the values there already. And I think, you know, don't take things personally would probably be one of the things, know why you're doing what you're doing. I think empathy is, uh, you know, being passionate about what you do. Empathy is such an important thing. And I see people rapidly blaming, especially, you know, we, we're in an, an epoch, we're in a, in a time now where there's a lot of, um, how do you say that? I, I talk French so much, I'm finding, I'm find, having trouble finding my English, but the, 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 the réseau social or the, the Facebook and all these things. And people, you know, turn a bit nasty. And I think it's really important, especially when we're working with horses, is to see the innocence and to have that empathy, uh, to not take things personally, to maintain passion in what you're doing. Mm. Uh, but, but, but uh, you know, especially, you know, you, you don't know everyone's story. I don't know every horse's story. Every horse that comes to me has a story. Uh, and I can't go getting upset with that horse. I don't know his story. I can get some information. But he'd have a story. He'd have his reasons why he's in a difficult situation, particularly when we're, particularly when we're re-educating the horses and things. And I, and I think that to, you know, and and, and avoid that, that that sort of situation where if it's not going your way, getting caught up in that denial and blame and anger and chaos and all those things that 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 are really not nice things about the human. And when you get to work with horses, we, we don't have all those things. So we don't have to worry about that. And you think, well, if humans could be almost as nice as horses, we'd all get along a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. And it's extremely inspiring. I thank you very much for your time. And I wish you the very best in your work. And I hope to reconnect soon. And I hope I can visit your beautiful place very soon. Well, we'd be happy to have you. Bordeaux in the southwest of France. It's not a bad little area. So we're pretty, we're pretty good here. Nice horses, nice people, and and a lovely little spot of the world. I do miss Australia sometimes, but uh, for the time being, I'm fine. Very good. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good luck, everyone. Bonne continuation. <laughs>